this Tuesday, we as, as Americans will be celebrating Veterans Day. We'll be thanking God for, for those men and women who have answered the call to duty, who were willing to, to step up and to go places that, that you and I cannot go, and to do things that you and I would not be willing to do. We thank God for those people. And what sets soldiers apart from civilians is the way that they're trained. And one of the things that, that soldiers are trained to do is to be, to be vigilant. The, the U.S. Army Ranger Creed says, Never shall I... civilian who is walking through the, the village or the city that is a little bit fidgety, any sound that just doesn't sound right, and their senses are alerted, and they're, they're keen to what's going on, and they have this constant flow of, of adrenaline that is rushing through their bodies to keep them in that state. And it's hard for our soldiers when they come back to the States to turn that off. It often comes at a detriment to their health, both physically and mentally and spiritually. But that's the kind of hypervigilance, that's the kind of state of mind that the Apostle Paul encourages you and I to remain in as Christians because Christ is coming and he's coming soon. So Paul says to you and to me today, be alert. Our lesson this morning is from the Apostle Paul's letter to Christians who were living in the city of Thessalonica. It was a bustling seaport in, in modern-day Greece, about 200,000 people. And, and Paul wrote this letter to them because they were undergoing severe persecution for their faith in Jesus. And Paul wrote this letter to encourage them to stand firm in spite of persecution. But the other half of the letter is, is addressed to their questions about eschatology. It's a fancy word for the study of end times. They had a lot of questions about the end times. They had a lot of questions about the resurrection of the dead and, and Jesus' final coming. And so Paul wrote to them, he says, uh, Now, brothers, and you can follow along in your, your service folder with the second lesson. I'll be referring back to this. In verse 1, he says, Now, brothers, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you. Since the time of Christ, people have speculated as to when he's going to return. And people have always predicted when Jesus is coming. Remember about three years ago, that group in Raleigh, North Carolina, that said Jesus is coming on May 21st, 2011. Jesus prophesied that was going to happen. But he said, when people do that, he says, don't pay attention. Because Paul says in verse 2, For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. In our, the subdivision in which I live, we had about seven break-ins in the span of six weeks. It was terrible. We don't know when that guy was going to come in and, and ransack those homes and, and steal everybody's stuff, but if those poor folks who had their stuff stolen knew at what time the thief was coming, they would be waiting with a friendly police officer. But the fact is, Paul says, we don't know when Jesus is coming, just like we don't know when that thief is going to break into the house. It will be unexpected. In fact, there are people who will, won't even be thinking about that, that Jesus is coming. If you look in verse 3, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. People say peace and safety because they, they have this inward sense of peace and, and relative safety, 
which means for the most part things are going well in their lives. Finances are good, kids are, are doing well in school, uh, they're paying the mortgage and it's almost paid off, uh, their retirement funds are, are doing well, their relationship with their spouse, well, maybe not the best that it could be, but you know what, it's better than most. And so they, they live in this relative peace and safety and they don't even think about what's going to happen. Paul says, just like when labor pains come on a pregnant woman. And ladies, you know what that's like, you who are mothers. When the baby's coming, the baby's coming. And there's nothing that you can do to stop that. When Jesus comes, he says, he is coming. And for some, it will mean destruction and they will not be able to escape. What Paul does next in verse 4 is he, he contrasts this last day experience with, with those who are not prepared and, and for us as Christians. He says, but you brothers, you are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. In another letter, the Apostle Peter explains exactly what this means. He says, but he has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. When we're born into this world, we're, we're born into the darkness of sin and, and death and, and unbelief. We're born spiritually blind so that we can't see God's awesome plan of salvation. And so what happens is we're stumbling through life, stumbling all the way to the, to the very gates of, gates of hell. We're in darkness. But God, by his grace and mercy, what he has done is he has shown the light of Christ in your heart through, through holy baptism. And that light has scattered the darkness of unbelief and death and hell and has, and has shown in your heart the light of faith and belief in Jesus. That's why Paul said to the Thessalonians, and what he says to you, is you are sons and daughters of the light and of the day. Because that's how they lived. That light of Christ that was in their heart was reflected in the things that they did and the things that they said. And Paul had mentioned that earlier in the letter. They knew that Christ was coming. And so they prepared those who were unprepared by sharing with them that same light of Christ so that they were no longer unprepared but were sons and daughters of the light. That's how they lived because that's who they were, sons and daughters of the light, of the day. So Paul says in verse 6, let us be, self, or let us be alert and self-controlled. Let us be alert. Why? Because Jesus is coming. The other thing, the, re the other reason why Paul says be alert is because of the darkness that still lives in this world. And he says, let us not be like others who are asleep. For those who sleep, sleep at night or during pastor sermons. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. The first picture there is someone who is, is sleeping, right? The person who is sleeping sleeps at night and they have no idea what's going on in the world, nor do they care. And there are people who are living that way, who are spiritually sound asleep and have no idea that Christ is coming. And the second picture that, that Paul paints, paints here is, is that of a drunk. The, the drunk drinks away his or her problems. They, they sit in that state of stupor and, and forget about their worries and cares and anxieties for a while. They don't care about it. Some people live that way spiritually. But even though unbelievers are, may not be sure that they're concerned about the last day, all people have a conscience. And all people know that they're going to have to stand before the throne of God and answer for the things that they've done. Paul says, you're, you're not like that. But he says, be alert because the temptation is out there. The temptation is out there to... Uh, to, to dull our conscience with that man-made religious brandy and, and it tastes like this. Well, I'm, I'm a good person. 
I, I'm better than, than most people. And, and if I do something wrong, it's okay. God is that, that kindly grandfather in heaven who pats me on the head and says, well, that's okay, Paul. Don't worry about it. Most people are going to heaven anyway. That's what that one tastes like. Or, or they'll drink the wine of, of, today's, of today's pleasures. You've heard it said, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Dave Matthews sings about that in some of his songs. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die because th this is all we have. So make the most of it because when we die, that's it. That's why Paul says, be alert. Always be on the watch. Have that heightened sense of awareness, like a soldier in combat, on patrol, hyper vigilant. Because if you're not, bad things happen, don't they? And that's the warning that Paul has for the, us this morning. When we are always on alert, high alert, and when we are waiting and watching and Jesus doesn't come, that's exhausting. It's kind of like sitting in your deer stand during hunting season. You get there well before the crack of dawn and you're sitting there with your rifle and you are alert. You hear every sound. You are watching. You are waiting. But it gets exhausting. And what happens is that poor hunter falls asleep in his deer stand, doesn't he? How worse, how much worse it is for, for us who are not hypervigilant in waiting for Jesus' second return. We get lazy. We get impatient. We get sleepy. And that's when Satan attacks. And what he does is he fires the, the RPGs of disappointment into our life. A disappointment with your relationship with your spouse or with your children or with a brother or a sister. A disappointment with your finances. A disappointment with your career. He allows the mortar rounds of, of bad health to come dropping down into your life. And you forget that God still loves you. You forget to pray to Him, forget to rely on Him. And he fires a laser-guided missile right to your heart when a loved one, someone close to you, dies. And you question God. And then he fires round after round of temptation into your life to, to focus more on the here and the now. My concerns, my comfort, my, my pleasures. And we forget about the big picture. And that's exactly what Satan wants. And so the danger there for us is that we fall asleep. That no longer are we hypervigilant. No longer are we concerned, but we become lazy and God forbid that we fall asleep. But Paul says that's not who you are. That's not who you are. He says you are sons and daughters of the light and of the day. Look at verse 9. Paul says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's will that you not die, that you not be destroyed by Satan and all of the weapons that he employs on his behalf. God's will is that he chose you to receive salvation. He designated you to receive eternal life. And he tells how he did that. He said, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the fact is, Jesus is light and, and we not, are not always. The Apostle John said, in him there is no darkness at all. You see, he had those same RPGs of disappointment that came rocketing into his life. Disappointment with his own family members. Disappointment with his own disciples when they didn't always get it. And they had their mind focused on the here and now and not focused on heavenly things. But Jesus remained vigilant. He remained focused on his job. And he had that laser-guided missile directed right to his heart when some of his friends died. But he did not despair. 
but remained focused on God and his word and his promises. That's why in Jesus there is no darkness at all. That's why he said, I am the light of the world. That's why God appointed you to receive eternal life in heaven, because Jesus is your light. And then what does he say in verse 10? Look at that passage. He died for us so that we may live together with him. Not only did Jesus live that life of light with no darkness, but he went to the cross to die for all the times that we've been lazy, for the times that we've been lax, the times that maybe we've fallen asleep on the job. Jesus died for us. So that what? So that you may live together with him. That's what God has made you. To be sons and daughters of the light. God appointed you. He chose you to receive salvation. He made it happen through Jesus so that you will live together with him forever in heaven. That's who you are. And that's why Paul says, be alert. Be self-controlled. Look at verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. What Paul is describing there is the, the armor of a Roman soldier, and the, and the citizens of Thessalonica would have understood that because they saw the Roman soldier on patrol every day in their city. And that breastplate that he's talking about is that body armor that protects the vital organs of the soldier. Paul says, put on faith and love as that body armor. Faith, faith trusts that God has done everything that he has promised you, isn't it? Faith trusts that God appointed you, that he chose you to receive salvation. salvation. Faith trusts that God carried that out through Jesus Christ. Faith trusts that God called you to faith through holy baptism. And faith trusts that God will take you home to heaven as he has promised. That's powerful body armor. That stops the attacks of Satan, doesn't it? And then he says, not only put faith on, but love as body armor. Because that's what faith does. Faith expresses itself in love. Love for God. And in this case, faith wants to love God by listening to what he's asked us to do. In this case, to be alert. And so that's what we're going to do. Because that's who we are. Put on faith and love as that body armor. Put on the hope of salvation as that, that helmet. And this is a Kevlar helmet that cannot be penetrated by any type of spiritual ammunition. Because hope is the sure certainty of heaven. And that's something that Satan cannot take away from you. That's why Paul says, put that hope of salvation on as a helmet. That's powerful body armor. Something that Satan cannot take away from you. And so that's why Paul says to you, be alert. And the other thing too is, is as, we, as, as we march through this life as, as soldiers of Christ, we know that we're not alone. And this is so, something else that makes soldiers in our United States Armed Forces unique, is that they have a battle buddy. The battle buddy is, is that soldier that stands next to you, crouches next to you, or lays down next to you in the, in the trenches. You rely on him and he, he relies on you. You support each other. And that's exactly what Paul is describing here in the last part of his, his letter. He says, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Paul commended the Thessalonians because that's what they were doing. They were encouraging each other. They were building each other up, just like battle buddies do. He says, keep doing that. And so when you see a fellow Christian soldier who is, is being attacked by these disappointments in life, encourage them. Build them up with that body armor. Remind them of what God says to them. He says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. Plans to give you hope in a future. God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. 
When you see a fellow Christian soldier who is, who is being attacked by, by poor health, remind them that when they're weak, God is strong. And that God promises to bless you through suffering. He promises to refine your faith through that suffering when you rely and lean on him and not on yourself. And when you know of a fellow Christian who has to lay a loved one in the grave, you encourage them and remind them of what the Holy Spirit says. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They will rest from their labors. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives my mansions to prepare. He lives to bring me safely there. Be alert, because that's who you are. You are sons and daughters of the light. You are sons and daughters of the day. And God has appointed you to receive salvation through your Lord Jesus Christ, so that you may live together with him forever in heaven. May God grant it to us for Jesus' sake. Amen.